Good afternoon, everyone. It is Tuesday, March 16th, and we will be continuing in our book, Wish. We are on chapter 18. Me and Howard rode our bikes up and down the mountain road all morning long. We trampled through woods, pushing our way around thick shrub and stepping over picker bushes. We went back to the creek behind Howard's house three times, calling and whistling. We peered under porches and open sheds and circled barns. By lunchtime, the blazing summer sun overhead left pockets of melted asphalt on the road and trickles of sweat down our backs. We didn't talk much, and that was fine by me. I'd gone over and over in my head how I would say I'm sorry to Howard for what I said about his wish. But whenever I thought the time was right, my mouth went dry and my throat squeezed up and the words I'd planned to say st stayed bottled up inside. We went back to Gus and Bertha's a few times to check the trap, but the table scraps were still in the pie tin. We had lunch on Howard's front porch, sitting on the couch, eating sausage and cold pork and beans off of paper plates on our laps. Dwight and Cotton were in the yard throwing rocks at the mailbox. They hit the metal with a loud thwang and left little dents in the sides. Mrs. Oldman came out and told them to stop, and then she sat on the couch and told me not to worry. She was sure Wishbone would come back. You got to think positive, she said. Yes, ma'am, I mumbled. Did you know I'd say that mean thing to Howard if she knew I bet she wouldn't want me on her team anymore. No. That afternoon, Burl drove us into town to search parking lots and dumpsters. Dwight and Lenny made some lost dog signs and we nailed them to the telephone poles and fence posts. It was almost supper time when me and Howard rode our bikes back to Gus and Bertha's and checked the trap one more time. Then we sat in lawn chairs by the garden and watched dragonflies flit over the tops of the marigolds. In my head, I said, Howard, I'm sorry. I said that to you about your wish. You know, about your up-down walk. Then I'd say, shoot, nobody even cares about your up-down walk. But then he'd know that that was a big fat lie because he saw those kids leaving him off their kickball games and cutting in line in front of him like he was invis invisible. So I sat there in silence with my thoughts spinning in my head. Maybe he didn't care what I said. I mean, he was still being nice to me. He was helping me look for Wishbo. You sure, you sure do look f forlorn, Howard said. I don't know one other kid in the whole world who would use that word, word forlorn. But that was perfect word to describe me. Forlorn? Just before supper, Jackie called and told me that she saw Scrappy in jail and he got a tattoo. Don't you even want to know what it is, she asked when I didn't say anything. Um, sure. A bird, she said. A black bird in a cage, right on the back of his hand. Can you believe that, she said. I guess. Then she rambled on about how graduating from high school wasn't all it's cracked up to be and how much she hated her job at the Waffle House. People leave the tables all nasty with syrup, she said, and they plop their crying babies in a high chair and expect me to bring them their blueberry waffles in like a minute. She told me that her boyfriend Arlo wrecked his car and turned out to be a big loser. And Carol Lee saw him at the mall with Darla Jacobs, she said. So I told him, adios, sucker, and then, Aren't you gonna ask me about Wishbone, I said. What, she said. I'd been telling her all about Wishbone when she called. How smart he was and how he learned to sit and stay and how he slept beside my bed. Wishbone, I said, my dog. Aren't you even gonna ask about him? Oh, sure, she said. How was Wishbone? Gone, I hollered, he's gone. And then I spewed out the whole story and how he'd run off and how I'd look everywhere, but I figured he'd rather be astray than live with me. I tried to stop, but I couldn't. I moved on about how he didn't want me 
me the same as nobody else wanted me and how I hoped she was enjoying her perfect life while I was stuck here in Colby with a bunch of squirrel eating hillbillies. And then I hung up and sat on the phone with my back against the wall. I could see that Bertha in the kitchen stirring something on the stove and pretending like she hadn't heard me. When the phone rang again, I just looked at it there in my hand. Bertha stopped stirring. Ring, ring, ring. Hello, I said in a trembling voice. Charlie? Jackie's voice floated through the telephone line, soft and sure. From Rowley to Colby, I pictured that voice traveling from Carolee's fancy brick house along highways and over treetops and then onto the winding roads and down the gravel driveway into this little house perched on the side of a mountain and finally getting to me, sitting on the floor and needing to hear it. I'm sorry about Wishbone, Jackie said. I really am. I hope he comes back. I watched a fly dart from the window screen to the lamp and to the ceiling. Charlie, Jackie said. What? I knew this whole situation had, I know this whole situation has been hard on you. Situation, I said. Is that what it is? A situation? I think Mama's getting better, Jackie said. I talked to her yesterday and she sounded better. What did that mean? That she got out of bed? That she got her feet on the ground? That she cared one little bit about me? That I'd go back to Rowley and our broken family would suddenly disappear and in its place would be a real family holding hands and, sing, and singing the blessing? Maybe I can come visit you soon, Jackie went on. I'm going to get my driver's license here in a couple of weeks. Did I tell you that? And Carol Lee got a car for me for graduation. Can you believe that? <clears throat> if I get some time off from my godforsaken job, I could come to Colby. We would go to Asheville and hang out. We would have, they have vegan restaurants there. Do you know that? I'm thinking about becoming vegan. And I bet if I... She jabbered on and on and on about all the things that we could do. But she left out one part about how she would go back to her perfect life and I would still be here without my dog and wishing I hadn't been mean to Howard. That night when Gus got home, the three of us drove around looking for Wishbone. We went down to the school and over to the diner. We drove through trailer parks and up alleys. While we drove, Bertha told us stories about how she'd read in the newspaper about a dog that fell over in the back of a van in North Carolina and managed to find his way back home to Indiana. Almost 400 miles, she said. The family had been on vacation over in Maggie Valley. I can't hardly believe it. Gus was quiet, shifting a toothpick from one side of his mouth to the other while he scanned the roadside and the parking lots in the woods as he drove. Every now and then he'd say, Don't worry, Butterbean. We'll find him but I was thinking that maybe it was time to change my wish. Maybe next time I'd gotten a chance, I wish my dog would come back. Finally, it got too dark to see much of anything, so we headed home. We turned into the driveway and that old car bounced and squeaked over the holes, the crunch of tires on gravel echoing in the still evening air. The headlights sent beams of light dancing through the mountain laurel and choke berries besides the driveway. Finally, the house came into view and I thought my heart was going to leap right out, at, out of me at what I saw. There was Wishbone, wagging his tail as he trotted towards us, dragging his leash on the ground behind him. Thank <laughs> Time for another one, or? Uh, you got quarter two right now. Okay. That's it for today. Have a good day.